He's Tim Schwartz. That's Eric Ogershock. We're from Real Ale Brewing Company. You're, You're watching, watching the Beer Diaries. Diaries. Rolling fast down I 35 through the day and past the Hey folks, this is Greg Zeschuk from uh, The Beer Diaries, and I'm here in Blanco, Texas at Real Ale Brewing Company. These guys have been around a while, and I apologize that we have the small glasses, but we're going to taste a lot of beer today. So we'll start small, but we'll go for a long time. I'm here with Tim Schwartz, the Directory of Brewing Operations, and Eric Ogershock, the Brewmaster. So let's get down to business. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, as folks may recognize, those are some very prestigious medals we'll talk about a little later. So. Hey guys, thanks for being here. I mean, thanks for, I mean, thanks, thanks for, thanks for letting thanks us for be here. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for coming to Blanco. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. I mean, and obviously the show right now, we're kind of focusing on the Austin, Austin brew scene, and you guys are a big part of it, even though you're a little bit out of town. Like, uh, the brewery's been here how long? How long's the history? We've been open 16 years. Wow. Um, this facility's been open since the end of 2006. We originally were on the square in the basement of Cranberry's Antiques, so right by the old courthouse downtown. And we had old place with nine foot ceilings uh no floor drains yeah no. <laughs> charming but uh, yeah. challenging it's kind of yes. <laughs> quaint but really tough to brew in yeah, yeah yeah well yeah i mean i think that's one of the amazing things is uh i mean the history you guys have like there's people kind of forget they come to austin nowadays and see all these choices the reality is i mean there are only a few folks doing it. you were one of the one of the first and what, what was that like what's 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 what was sort of forging the new ground like well i mean I don't know, I always like telling this story, this might not be exactly direct to the question, but I started a real L, and the first year we did 450 barrels yeah. that year. That was 2000. Which is pretty big. That's, that's, that's and, nice. and we thought that we were real busy. When we brew that, we brew 480 barrels in like a day and a third now. <laughs> so if you look at that, it's pretty insane how much, you know, not only Real Ale has progressed in the Texas market, yeah. but just how far craft brewing has come yeah, yeah. In, in that time. That's only 300 times, isn't it? Like, it's, it's, <laughs> that's just a small amount. But I mean, like the facility here is really impressive. I think we're gonna, you know, get a little tour from you guys. We'll get some B rolls so folks can see it. But it's, you know, coming out here, beautiful little piece of land and the lovely country as well. Yeah, it's beautiful out here in the hill country. Yeah. And yeah, when we go and walk through the facility, you'll see we just added on a really nice uh, packaging hall and a warehouse where we're also storing our barrel program, right. uh, which Eric will be really uh, excited to tell you about. Cool. Definitely. Definitely. It's something that we wanted to do, but you think about operating in a basement that's this tall <laughs> with no floor drains and every square inch is yeah. you know, crammed with tanks. Yeah. Your office is not even on site anymore because you can't fit an office in there. Oh, you're you, kidding. You, you can't do barrels. In terms of the, the water, is there anything special about where you are here? I mean, water, of course, being probably the largest and perhaps most important ingredient in beer. Anything interesting water-wise for you guys? It's a good water source. Um, the water is hard, so it gives us some, some issues with our, you know, our hot liquor tank, our boiler. You know. mm -hmm. uh, but as far as brewing quality, it's really nice. It has some nice calcium, a little magnesium. Uh, the pH isn't as high as in Austin, uh, but you know, it's a good base brewing water. Cool. So another thing we always really like to know about on the beer diaries is, is how you got into beer in the first place. What was it? Was there one beer? Was it an experience? I mean, Tim, how about your experience? Anything special? Um, well, I was when I was in college, I started getting into craft brew. Uh, well, getting into drinking craft beer. Right, right. And then started home brewing. And I was home brewing for four or five years. Started winning a couple of competitions around wow. Austin, and brewed my first beer at Waterloo Brewing Company. Um, that was probably shoot in '94. Because there were some originally some older um, breweries that aren't around anymore here in the Austin area, like or, you know Austin environs. What, what so Waterloo was one of them. Waterloo Brewing Company was a great brew pub, uh, and of course Bitter End was right uh, down there. Right, right. I brewed at Bitter End for ten years. That, oh, that yeah. was my first brewing job actually. Um, we had Copper Tank. Copper tank. We had oh, Armadillo. Yeah. Uh, we had Stone House. Was it? 
<laughs> Stonehouse Brewing or yeah, something? I don't, remember, I, yeah, I don't remember that one. Uh, it was a bunch of guys from New Zealand that yeah. opened up a pub, and it's where Opal Divine's on uh, 6th oh, Street. Oh, okay, is. yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And so, yeah, there was a lot of brew pubs that were open in the, in the mid-90s, some of which have closed, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, I won a homebrew competition that allowed me to brew a batch of beer at Waterloo, yeah. which was an American brown ale, which was, that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, a couple months later, I was hired as the assistant brewer at Bitter End, mm -hmm. and three months after that, I took over as head brewer when the, when the uh, original uh, head brewer there moved to Chicago. Cool. So that's kind of how I got my start. It was fortuitous uh, circumstances there where I just went really quickly from home brewing up to a yeah, head brewer yeah, in the pub. I brewed there for 10 years, and I've been out here for eight. So, so you got a little bit of experience in this brewing stuff. Yeah, that's and, pretty. That's pretty cool. You know, pub brewing's awesome because yeah. you get to brew lots of different styles. And smaller batches, obviously. Yeah, we, small, we were doing seven barrel batches, so yeah. brewed hundreds of batches a year and just all kinds of good, good stuff. So that that gave me a lot of experience style wise. Out here, you know, it's larger batches. You're doing sixty barrels yeah. at a time, and we do some really cool stuff. But you don't get to brew quite as many. Yeah, styles. yeah. We're gonna talk. Right. I mean, that's some of the, you guys came out with a brand new line. Like, I think yeah. the Brewers Cut, which oh, we'll yeah. talk about in a bit, but. Eric, how about you? Was there, a, was there a magical beer moment or just, again, sort of experience that kind of grew and grew? Um, it was literally just about changing my life just because I'd, I'm a musician as well, and I had moved to New York to try to further that career, and it wasn't panning out, and I needed to do something that um, I could be happy doing. Yeah. The, the odd jobs you work sometimes in a big city to, to, to make a living are not very fulfilling so yeah. I wanted to do something that was creative and you know I could be proud of at the end of the day and I'd always had from a young age enjoyed you know beer yeah um, and I knew some friends who were involved and they invited me to come brew with them and I was a hard worker so they just kept on asking me back awesome so I ended up working as a volunteer for free um, at a, a brew pub in New York New York City it's no longer their Commonwealth Brewing Company and after that I decided hey I really like this um, I'm gonna try to get paid to do it. So I actually had to move uh, to Pennsylvania. Uh, so I worked at a brewery brew pub in down in Philly, yeah. and then I ended up working at Victory oh, um, cool. before I came back home to Texas. And, so that's uh, again look, journeyman kind of brewing experience. You probably saw a lot of people doing a lot of different things and you know different ways things are done. How, how does that? What, what's it like now here? I mean, you guys have this for you this big facility. How's how's it impacted your brewing? Well, it's kind of like coming full circle because when I started out, I started out on more sophisticated systems. Oh, okay. And then when I started to work here, I was just like, we were having a glorified homebrew setup. And I was like, wow, really taking it back <laughs> you know, to, the, to the roots. Um, when did you start here? When, when was that? 2000. Okay, so. So, yeah, I've been doing this for 17 years. Wow. Um, having the old stuff and then having the new stuff, equipment is a lot better. You just, it, it just helps you to do your job better. You can be more consistent. Um, and that's what we really want to be now, especially when you're the size that you are, yeah. that we are now. I mean, it's like if someone goes to the store and they they pull that you know six pack off the shelf, or if you're at a pub and they have a pint, you want to make sure that that pint of beer is what they had the last time. Yeah, yeah. Especially now in this age of media where people are online and they're posting stuff and then almost yeah. instantaneous feedback. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great transition to. I mean, it's been interesting for me. I've been in the Austin area about five years, and you know, I. I when I came here, Fireman's 4 was on taps, like almost all the taps. It was amazing. Was that, I mean, obviously with the, the, the Rio Blanco and the Full Moon, those were big beers as well, and the award winners too, but was this, was, was Fireman's 4 one of the beers that really kind of cracked it for you, or how, how, do you, how do you see sort of the history to get to the, the scale you guys are now? Fireman's was, uh, was and is a big part of that. I yeah. mean, it's, it's just a really nice, refreshing Texas summer blonde ale. Yeah. Um, and... It, it has a certain synergy about it, and I'm not sure if it's the, we just, you know, had the right moves on all of this. The beer was right, the tap handle was cool, uh, you know, just the whole fireman's aura just kind of yeah. really took off in Austin, and even before we put it in the bottle, it was like our main seller. Uh, yeah. It was outselling the other products that were in bottle and draft, so. It's, it's, it's got something about it that, you know, I don't know what it is. And well, it's one of those things that's maybe, it's kind of, like you said, brewed for the region. Like, it's got, it's a great warm weather beer, but also really mm -hmm. good with food. I mean, not only that, I mean, it's, it's been a great seller. Now it's award winning. I mean, it's silver medal, GABF, just, just very briefly, like this past weekend. Yes. Saturday. Yeah, that Monks, I mean, that must have been, fun. I mean, what was that like? Was it, like, amazing? Um, I mean, I don't know how, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it must be, because, I mean, the competition. Whenever you but, hear 
your beer go, you know, announced at the at the award ceremony, and you see it go on that big screen. Yeah, it is an emotional high, and you're just up out of your seat, jumping. You're yelling. Yeah, it's just yeah. awesome. It's, well, you guys put so much into yeah. it for so long. And um, yeah, this is uh, the first year we entered the Fireman's Four in the Blondale category. Oh. It's been doing well in another category, the English Summer Ale. Okay. But the categories are shifting a little bit, and we finally decided that the Blondale category was getting assertive enough for us to. Uh, put an unfiltered English ale based um, blonde ale in the right, competition right. because that's one thing about Fireman's it is even though it's a blonde ale it has some hop character it has some yeast character yeah, it's fairly yeah. complex even though it's refreshing and so we felt like the blonde ale category was shifting that way enough to where we put it in the blonde ale category and I'm really glad we did because we came <laughs> home with the silver. So, which, which, which one did you get first? Cause, I mean, you, there's two of them there. Uh, was, the, pills. the Hans Pils came first and so, that was awesome. And that's a silver as well. And that, yeah, and, yeah. That, and that, is that a new beer for you guys? Or? Yeah, I'll let Eric take that one. It's, we, it's the third year we brewed it, but it's the first year it's been in bottles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of like four squared. When we put it out draft only, it was one of the fastest selling beers we ever had. Yeah. I mean, people were, were just buying it's, it's, it. It's, I mean, it like I insane. mentioned earlier, I had it at this fine saucer here in town. I was blown away. I was like, what a delicious beer. Brad Farbstein, the owner of the brewery, he's, he's a big fan of, you know, Hoppy Pills beers, yeah. and um, this is actually one of the reasons I like, I, you know, I like working here was just to do a lot of different beer styles. And you know, we're a real ale brewing company, we but we never figured we'd be limited just to ale brewing. We wanted to brew lagers, and yeah. so when the time finally came up, because you know, capacity issues for for a while kept us from making some beers that we wanted to make, and lagers eat into capacity because yeah. of the time they take. So we finally were able to do it. And it was successful, and Brad was really happy. So we knew that one day that we were going to have to get it into that was a, a perfect, bottle package. Perfect pour in a micro micro glass, folks. Check that out. He's got a lot of experience. <laughs> Cheers. Um, but yeah, it's really, really hoppy pills. And um, I know personally, I can't speak for Tim, but when I heard when I heard that we got a silver medal for it, I was like jumping up and down. <laughs> Do you remember the moment you just come blacked out from one like, Whoa. Well, it's awesome. always just kind of shocking because yeah. like the, the, the ceremony starts and you hear other people's names get called and you kind of get in a groove. Your names get yeah, called yeah. and you're just like, you're not getting a medal. Then all of a sudden you hear, you know, your beer name and you're just like, holy shit. Well, and, well, <laughs> and, 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 and honestly, I mean, like, helpful to probably set the stage for folks. I mean, there are a lot of categories, but there are thousands of beers entered. In every category, there's at least 50 to 100, and some have 150 beers. Pills probably, I don't know the number, 70? I like, can't remember I now. know there was 60-something in the Blondale category, yeah, so, and the Pills, so, the German Pills category was you yeah, know, 40 so, to 60, I'm not sure. So that's a big deal. Like, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah. I mean, and you're, and you're competing against, in, in this case, the whole of the U.S., a mm -hmm. uh, lot of talented and established brewers who've been, been doing really this for years. really good beers. Yeah, so it's like, it's, and I think it, you know, it's a really nice sort of local success story in that case. And having two of them is, is spectacular. I mean. Well, and you know, the other thing, both of these beers are unfiltered. And you look at the clarity on that. Uh, this is unfiltered so, beer. So we did not have a filter in the brewery. Because uh, lagering actually, like it just, the, the yeast keeps going, it keeps going, and it tends to end clearer, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Is that it, takes it takes more time, yeah. to, especially more time at colder temperatures, because mm -hmm. you have to let uh, the yeast completely fall out of the beer and chill haze to form and fall out. So it takes a little more time and patience uh, to get it to clear up. Transitioning a little bit almost to a business, business oriented discussion with the brewing, I mean, you guys have a big capacity, it's a 60, 60 barrel system, is that right? And um, like you said, the amount that you guys can crank out is, is phenomenal. You have a lot of space here, so a lot of fermentation space as well. I mean, are you, is it, yeah, that's what I mean, are you still, are you meeting demand or is demand still outstripping? Um, we caught up with demand last summer when we installed a couple 480 barrel fermenters. So that's like, what, 16,000 gallons of beer in each one? Um, Remember, a, a year of production yeah, in 2000. Oh, oh, I know, like, and, you got one, and they're in one tank. Like. Yeah, one tank has 1,000 full-size kegs in it, you know, half barrel kegs. Um, so yeah, that's mind -boggling. That, that allowed us to catch up because yeah. we were yeah. running very low across the state yeah. last summer. Um, now we've caught up, uh, but now with all the new programs that are that we're putting out with the uh, Brewers it's Cut good. and a couple yeah. other seasonals, that are uh, beers that maybe need to stay in the tank longer, uh, it's it's tightening up again. But we do have a 240 barrel fermenter that we're going to install. We have a 360 barrel fermenter that we're bringing down from Oregon right. um, in the next month or so, and that should help us catch up again. 
How far afield are your beers available? Like how far? Um, Texas. Are they, all, all Texas? Yeah. Any all other of states? Texas and nothing else. Wow. It's Texas, Texas only. So, so Texans, uh, Texas is going to get some beer tourists to try out the award winner, <laughs> which is yeah. awesome. Good, that's good for the, good for the local uh, beer economy. Come we, on down. We hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we, we're like, very fond of, you know, of making more beers and not necessarily making it easier, you know, easier on ourselves. Like, yeah. let's make another dry hopped beer. Well, dry hopped beers take more time. Right. Yeah. Um, so we're not like, maybe. Well, and we're running three yeasts yeah. Yeah. on a regular basis now because we're doing Belgians, we're doing right, right. Uh, Lo- ale, you know, lager. American and English ales on the yeast, and then lagers. So. Right. Um, in terms of a bit about the laws, like I mean, obviously, I think one of the themes that's kind of, kind of gone through our show a little bit is just asking folks about the we we'll call them the unique Texas beer laws and and you know how they you know what what could be better to make your business stronger like what would you, what would you like to be different uh, and again if you well we've had some changes uh, you know with the labeling law yeah uh, um, that's that's yeah. opened up you know outside breweries to be able to bring their beers to Texas easier which is good because. Yeah. You uh, increase awareness of craft beer. You get more beers in here. It's, you know, that's all cool. It's helped some of the Texas brewers as well. Um, it's we were pretty used to that. So yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's actually helped us, but it has allowed us to put, uh, you know, what it is. On yeah, the more label, accurately rather cool. than calling yeah. like things malt liquors. Malt and liquor. <laughs> which, which, so. which, which is which in Germany is actually a capital offense. If, if you called that a malt liquor in Germany, you probably yeah, would I'm get sure the, thrown in the Rhine or something. I'm sure right? the German uh, breweries that were bringing their Doppelbox in to <laughs> Texas and having to put malt liquor on it, they were not happy about <laughs> or that. Or ale. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, for um, sure. So that's one thing. But you know, some of the Texas laws are really good. We can self-distribute. Some states you cannot self-distribute yeah, actually, if you're a small brewery. So sure. you know, we're... we're uh, what we're working with with the Texas Craft Brewers Guild is uh, trying to allow uh, brew pubs to be able to distribute a little bit, yeah, yeah, and allow uh, production breweries to be able to sell a small amount right. to the ultimate consumer, and that would help everybody out, especially small breweries. Yeah, um, and in the long run, what we want to do with that is just grow the Texas craft industry. Once you get to a certain size, you're wanna, you want to go to a distributor because yeah, it's yeah. a whole other business, and yeah. you can only do it for a certain amount of time. So uh, what we're trying to emphasize right now in this uh, legislative session is, hey, this is going to be good for everybody. It's going to be good for craft brewers. Yeah. It's going to be good for the Texas beer consumer, and it's going to be good for the beer distributor and the accounts. Everybody, the retailer, yeah, yeah. everybody wins if we can do this because you're going to get more uh, Texas craft breweries that stay open, you're going to get more consumer awareness because when you can come down to a place and actually buy a couple beers or buy a pint or whatever it is, um, you get excited about your local brewery yeah, and you yeah. start talking to your friends about it and the whole everybody you know, gets excited and the business grows for everyone. We were talking earlier about being in the Texas beer scene in the mid-90s. Yeah, you couldn't get near the amount of just crap beer from around the country in yeah. Texas as you have now. You didn't have as many breweries, right. you didn't have the consumer awareness. The guys who opened up there, including Real Ale and St. Arnold's uh, and Live Oak, they were having to preach craft brewing to an audience that wasn't as receptive and just keep chugging along. You know, in the yeah. first 10 years was tough. Yeah, for no, we talked to Chip yesterday and he said, I mean, because their, their first beer was a Pils, yep. you know, which again is a super delicious Pils, but for yep. folks it's like, it, it it's just, an awesome check. Pils. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and he, and he expressed how, how difficult it was, you know, in the first, first like yep. you said, years. Now, it wasn't just like six months. I mean, I think people take for granted how much work it took to, to get here. And the interesting thing for the show is, is you know, we, we talked to a lot of brewers, some folks have been here like three years, which is mm-hmm. aside from you guys who were here 15, 16, 17 years ago, is the next brewery, you know, like if there's yeah. a real big gap and yeah. there's a really reason for that. You guys kind of trailblazed and the path is open now, it's just crazy. Well, like what Eric was talking about, you know, this, this brewery had been open for four years and they were only making 450 barrels. Yeah. The guys that are open up now, they're doing a couple thousand barrels their first year, they're putting in more tanks or, yeah. you know, I mean, it's like, it's woo, like this now. Yeah, it's a different world. For, for yeah. a brewery that's just opened where it took five, six years to get to that level, yeah. if you even got to that level, Back in the mid nineties. Well, because yeah, some of the folks didn't make it, did they? Like, yeah, they, a lot of the folks. Yeah, there's now there were a few several breweries. that fell aside. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, it's shelf space was. I mean, not that it's not competitive now, but it, I mean, when you don't have, you walk into a place and the buyer there doesn't even know what craft beer is, and maybe he thinks that Guinness, 
and you know, and bass are the yeah. only yeah. other game in town. And yeah. It's like, yeah. what, I mean, bass, how, how bass. do you argue with that? Yeah. You know, how do you convince someone that there's something local and fresh that's not made by a bunch of yahoos? Right, right. Um, awards help. I'll give you one <laughs> one more interesting uh, statistic. Um, Scott Metzger down at Freetail did an economic impact study. You've probably have seen that, but. When you went from 2010 to 2011, mm -hmm. the craft beer volume produced in Texas increased 50% wow. in one year. That's incredible. I mean, that is telling you what is actually happening well, in also, Texas it, right now. And I think That's the other crazy. thing that important for folks to understand is there's okay more people serving it. There's more bars open. There's mm -hmm. more jobs there. Yeah. There's more jobs at breweries. Jobs. I mean, jobs. I mean, this creates jobs. Well, that's the one thing that I think doesn't even yeah. get stressed enough is that you know, There's a lot of folks working here. Jobs, yeah. I mean, when we, you can see the picture of what we were like not too long ago. There are nine people working. You know, yeah. now it's over forty. Wow, that's know? cool. And that's only uh, six years ago. Let's transition a little more focus on the range of beers you guys create. I mean, I think the reality is you guys have done a ton. Like, I mean, there's paraphernalia all over the room here for all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, you've got your core line of beers. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna probably flub on them. Um, use the brown ale. Yeah, Brewhouse Brown. Brown, Brewhouse Brown, the Rio Blanco, Blanco, which is a pale. It's an English gold medal winning. special better. Yeah. Yes, 2010 got to go. The full, the full Moon. Is that the Rye? IPA? That's a pale, pale Rye. rye. Pale, oh, that's right. That's that was always a really interesting yeah. beer because it was like, you know, it's hoppy but not that hoppy, right? Mm -hmm. um, Fireman's another one. Uh, is the coffee porter a regular regular rotation? That's a seasonal, it's a seasonal. and it's coming out right now. Are we? We're okay. actually we're bottling it today batch. for the first time for the yeah. season. And I think I think also I mean Devil's Backbone uh, is a wonderful just and that triple. Right? Was yeah. a seasonal, yeah, Belgian style triple. Yeah, and we've moved that to uh, a full time beer uh, starting last spring. Yeah, it's 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 a it's really I mean I I, I like I mean it's interesting because I mean I had it and maybe I think my taste and my palate improved because. When I had it this this past summer, like earlier in the year, I was blown away. I was like, "Wow, this is such a great!" And it's, it's you know m kind of mind blowing for folks to be making great Belgian style beers here. I mean, I think again, three four years ago, it was unheard of, right? Well, we're gonna uh, taste uh, in the new Brewers yeah. Cut series yeah. in, in a minute here. We're gonna taste our Black Quadruple. I had some last night. Oh yeah. Was, oh, oh okay, man. No, but I still taste Cuidado. Cuidado. <laughs> What's that? Cuidado. Cuidado. Be careful. Oh, okay. I don't. I'm from Canada. I speak French, sadly. It's useless. <laughs> Oops, sorry, I see on the camera. I'm in, big, I'm in big trouble. But yeah, we, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of different things. Some things don't even come out in bottles. We do a, a what's called real heavy. It's a, oh, yeah, a yeah, strong yeah. scotch ale. That's right. draft only in the winter. Right. Um, we are a Phoenix uh, it's double. The ESB. Yeah, double ESB. ESB. So what are the lines? I mean, the Brewer's Cut is one line, and the Mysterium. Mysterium Verum. Is I'm going to let Eric talk yeah, about that one. That's, that's a thing of its own, man. Well, Mysterium Verum, I mean, it was something that, I mean, I mentioned it briefly earlier that Tim and I had talked about for a while, like wanting to do some barrel aging and get into making, yeah. you know, some wild beers, some beers with, yeah. you know, that had some acidity to them, um, significant acidity, but we just never could do it. I mean, you, well, again, you, you're always trying to catch up. So, th so that's, that's when you have some time and some space again for the barrels, like we were talking about. The first time we, the, <laughs> there's probably been six months in the history of this brewery since I've been working here that we haven't been under construction. <laughs> and during that period, we got our first four barrels and filled them. Yeah, yeah. And so that was the beginning of Mysterium Verum. It was literally two barrels of barley wine and two barrels of scotch ale. And Sisyphus is? Sisyphus is the barley oh, wine. Right. So we put them into barrels, they change, we give them different names. And that's when we started ah, coming up with cool. the series because we needed to separate them from um, what the, the parent beer was. Back to the consistency point, people would try this and go, if it's at all associated with the parent, they think probably if it's not close, which they wouldn't be out of a barrel, right. they get kind of confused. Well, if I put you in a barrel for six months, you're going to be a totally different dude. <laughs> I'd be a zombie at that point. <laughs> so if, it's it's like full, that. If, if it's full of beer, I'd be pickled. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> and happy, and you know, I'd carefully nurse myself on the beer. I mean, we we're, we're, we're definitely want people to know what the beer was, but we don't want the beer that comes out of the barrel to be judged yeah. by its former self right, because right. it's a no, new it's thing, right. especially when you start talking about, you know, wild yeast and bacteria, yeah. which was the ultimate goal that we wanted to do because we were both big fans of Lambics yeah, yeah. and, you know, the the Flanders, Flanders, yeah. Flanders yeah, 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 no, for sure. So we, um, you know, we knew that eventually we'd get to that point, but it takes a while to neutralize those barrels. You want to get, you know, those vanillins. You want to get that stuff out right. so that, because it's not really a big part of, of wild beer. Right. And we've kind of taken the ball and run with it now. The program, I won't say it has a mind of its own, but we're, we've been really inspired by the native microflora. Yeah. And yeah. we have been 
probably making as many beers within that series as we can possibly make. We haven't maxed out our space over there yet, but, but it's... But you're making a lot. It, is there one to try? Is there anything available to yeah. take, take a sip of? Okay. We are going to hit you with it last, but... Um, well, actually, why don't we do that? I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I totally might, agree. I totally that agree one's on, going to kind of blow our palate, because that yeah. is a sour one. Okay, no, we'll, we'll do that last. So what do you want? What you, the pale, you think? Oh, yeah, or, let's okay. go to Brews so let me just Let me hold that up for product placement purposes. <laughs> there we go. Product and beard together. Um, so what's this? This is Signature Hop Ale. What was the thinking? Or even, let's step back a moment. Brewer's Cut, another line you guys made. What's, what's the Brewer's Cut line? Well, Brewer's Cut is a smaller release, smaller batch kind of line that um, allows all of our brewers to kind of get creative and, you know, let, a, let, let hmm, I guess it lets everybody rotate through some styles. Also, oh, folks, so some of the brewers can, like, say, hey, I want to do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's like, we'll, we'll get a big list of styles, and it's like, hey, you want to take lead on this? Which one are you interested in brewing? You know, so they'll, uh, they'll come up with a preliminary recipe, and then we'll kind of get together and talk about it, and, you know, we'll all come up with an agreement on how that beer is going to be brewed, but one person takes lead on it. Um, yeah, they do the background, they do the research, learn a little, little bit about the style. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be fun for them, so it's just not Tim and I dictating. Yeah, yeah, This yeah. is what we're making. Yeah, no, that's, and this and this one's in, really interesting. It's signature hot pale ale. Um, what what, what it's, I'm it's 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 like a I, I cheated a little bit because I looked on the on the box, but it's like Hercules. Jer yeah, it's, yeah. And so so it's it's you know a lot of us are familiar with the North American over the top citrus bomb. This is the, the more classic German, you know, spicy, earthy. It's a diff it, it's better. The interesting Definitely, thing about this, it has a combination of both. Traditional German and U.S. hop character. This is a high alpha German hop that hasn't been around that long. A lot of people, you know, there hadn't been that many it's people brewing with it. It's an unfamiliar taste, actually. That's what, yeah. which is neat. You try it and you're going so, like, like, kind of like a hybrid. Very unique. Um, it has some lime peel. It has some tropical fruit. It also mm -hmm. has a little bit of that American ranginess and a little bit of spicy German thing going on. So it's a really interesting combination hop. Yeah. Um, we call this signature hop pale ale because we're going to have other hops come out ah, in cool. this series, and we can't always guarantee that it's going to be a single hop. Because if we're doing a really low alpha hop that we want to have for the flavor and aroma, we can't get enough bitterness in there yeah, unless yeah. we just throw tons of it in and it kind of mucks up the beer a little yeah, bit yeah. if you throw too much hop mass in the kettle or in the whirlpool or in the right. dry hop. So um, this one happened to be 17% alpha hop, so we could use it for bittering and all the way through. So it's a single hop pale ale. So all, all three, the, the, the bittering, the aroma, and the flavor. And, dry and the dry hop. Oh. There's, there's just hops <laughs> stuffed in this well, no, thing, it, man. It, 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 like and I said, it's, it's a, I, mean, I, it's, you know, I get it now. I'm, I'm pulling a little bit of that citrus out, but mm -hmm. still, it's, it, but I, what I really get is like the uniqueness. Yeah. Uh, like I said, real earthy. It's, and it's funny because you read it in a book, and you go, oh, German hops are typically you know, herbal, this, uh, yeah. spicy, earthy, yeah. those type and of things. And now this is actually, this is a good, this is for beer scientists. Yeah, focus people who want to like work work their palates because it's really unique. Like, so I'm gonna get you the other brewers. Yeah, cut. let's let's try the other other brewers cut. And so, um, the brewers cut is is something that you think how frequently you think folks will see new ones on the market like every month or two or how often do you think we'll see them? Um, I mean, that depends on how fast everybody buys we'll that beer. Um, we're putting we're putting six packs out for regular gravity beers and then higher gravity beers. We're putting out in four packs. Okay. So we're putting two at a time out. So this would, this is probably a four pack. That's a four then. pack beer right here. This is our uh, Belgian style black quad. I have to I have to tell you I cheated and had this last night. <laughs> it's over at the over at the whip in. I was like, hey, no I problem. Gotta, I gotta try that one out because it's like I saw. It's funny because I walked in, I saw the new taps. You guys you guys have gone through a bit of reband branding too. Like I think the, the whole the whole whole approach you're taking is is again brand expanding. Bruce cut is its own thing. Yeah, it's a whole new look on that. Yeah, this is, you know, it's interesting because you, you know, you look at it, and again, folks that don't know beer all that well would think dark, bitter, it's, but it's a, it's a nice sweetness on the palate. Pretty, it's pretty, like, yeah, the, the, the gravity's pretty high, like, I, I definitely, and the mouthfeel. It's 22 Play-Doh. Oh. So yeah. it's a, you know, it's, it's about it's a big beer. in that almost barley wine. It's really creamy. Kind of area. It, yeah. Like, especially, especially on the tap here, it's like, wow. It's the just, yeast is very voracious, and it has no problem dealing with producing a beer with a prodigious amount of alcohol in it. So what what's in a quad? Like what makes a quad a quad for the viewers? Like is it there's four ingredients or is it four processes or what what how would you simplify it down to four a four times the strength of a single. <laughs> four times the power. So I mean there's oh. a debate over triple. Is it triple fermented? Is yeah, it three times exactly. the strength but quad it's just basically 
the next level up. I mean, you might liken it to like West of Later and Twelve. I mean, right. that could be called a quad, even though they don't label it as such. Right. Is it twice as a double? Yeah. So there, it's so it's, it's Belgian, it's, so it's loosey goosey. You can kind yeah, of right. you have some room to operate. What are what are some of your guys' favorite beers around town that aren't yours? Like you guys, I mean, one thing that's pretty cool. I mean, town meaning the broad town, not Blanco, but. <laughs> the broad Round area. town, oh, Round man, town, that's tough. Uh, it's all your beers, but, but like I think because one thing that's really Round cool is, is, is an easy answer actually. <laughs> that would, but uh, you know, there's such, there seems to be a real, real good sort of camaraderie among the, among the, yeah. the brewers in the in the, in the area. There's a lot of guys in Austin who are doing really good stuff. I mean, as far as um, you know, old school, I got to go back to Live Oak with their pills and their Hefeweizen. Yeah. They're, they're a couple world class beers. Oh, Chip, Chip, um, poured, Chip lovingly poured me this Hef yesterday with this awesome like conical head, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Quick, hold it, take a pic." I'm like, "It was, it was," and it was, you know, again, it, I tweeted it was like the best, you know, the best one I ever had made with love. It was just so good. But yeah, I mean, yeah. his beers are. And you know, there's there's a couple new guys doing a lot of good stuff. I mean, I think Austin Beer Works is doing some yeah, really nice yeah. beers. Uh, I li I really like the way their cans look too. I mean, they I think they've done a lot of Clean, good things. Fresh, Plus like their their ad with the unicorn. Yeah, that's awesome. For the Einhorn, <laughs> it's it's badass. I mean, come on. That is awesome. Um, I gotta I gotta give a shout out. Um, go old school with Brian Peters. Yeah. yeah. Uncle yeah. Billy's. Oh, yeah. uh, medal winning. Guy still like, he's it was, just it was crushing a, it. Was a Hellas, right? Like he did, it was his medal. Uh, the, the bottle rocket. Bottle rocket. Yeah. I, I got. I mean, he's crushing that category. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I don't know how that. many medals he's won in the last like four or five years or whatever. It's amazing, but eh? in, in that Zwickle beer category, yeah, he's had several different beers and just like kicking butt in that category. You know, it's really funny because I think that's really always amusing and in a good way is whenever we visit someone, we'll often see someone else's keg or their can. Like, you know, there's there, everyone's like does beer trades and it's just a, it's a. Yeah, it's you, a lovely environment. You'll see some growlers around here, you know, free tail. Well, yeah. Other places. Cool. Oh, yeah. So maybe you should try the Mysterium as the finisher because I yep. think yep. I'm being beaten by this tiny glass. Normally, I can handle it, but mm. this is—I mean, this is this is a. What well, is 10% plus? <laughs> it's yeah. really, really good though. Like it's. Well, that's cool. It's got that real nice dark fruit in there. Yeah. We use uh, some Belgian dark crystal malt in there that gives it that kind of dark malt raisin. Yeah. Kind of thing. The yeast gives it that real nice fruitiness. It's, 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 it, the finish though is kind of light. Like it, it's not cloying or, or, or coating. Like that's a really the interesting. The sweet is in the middle. Yeah. And then that dark that dark malt, we use a German dehus black malt in there. That helps dry it out. And the yeast fully attenuates this beer so that it's not too sweet and cloying. Right, right. So it's it's got a, it's a very complex, but you can still drink a bit of it. And we're not easing up on you as far as alcohol is concerned because this is a very strong beer. It's, it's over nine It's cloudy, brown, lovely. I mean, the nose on this is insane. Yeah. And he said it's pretty strong. Yeah, it's over 9%. Mm. Two indigenous native, well, that's, I guess, a redundancy, but yeah, two indigenous wild yeasts, um, Brett Brooks, and um, another Brett, and some bacteria some, you know, from some friends at another brewery. I've never had a sour like this, and I drink a lot of sours. Like, this is really, I mean, the, Where's this, what's the scotch piece of it? Like in the sense of like the scotch ale, I mean, typically, you know, there's the, I think you said it was like, you know, I feel like the wee heavy and the scotch ales, I mean, some of the smokier ones. Um, like how does it, how do you put this together? Like it's just, it's just crazy. Cause I think it's totally unique. Well, the real heavy, I mean, there's, there's no smoke malt in it. So you're not, you're not going to pick up any of that. The barrel's neutral when we put it in there. And okay. there's, they're all. So you're using the neutral barrel mainly for yeah. the, so you're not trying to leach anything. Uh, the it's interesting just... thing about this, uh, the barrels were turned a bunch of times, but because of the pH drop and the amount of time that this beer spent in the barrel and the alcohol, it ended up pulling some of the barrel character out of there, uh, which we weren't expecting, but it like blended it's in so really powerful. nicely. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, you get a little bit of red wine and a little bit of that barrel character, but it's not just hitting you with, Vanilla and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, you don't get the oakiness or kind the of, vanilla. Yeah. Like, I definitely, I can, when you mention the red wine, I can it's definitely. It's just adding to the complexity of this beer, which is What's also, way it's, out again, there. it's got an interesting creaminess to it. Like, the, the mouthfeel is really unique. Because a lot of the sours I find aren't, I'm not, what's, I call them thin, but they're definitely lighter body. Like, they're yeah. not a. The, the, in the, the like, original heft of the beer is definitely present, but Scotch Ale makes a good base beer for doing something like this because there is residual there that the, our house yeast was never going to be able to get into, right. which Britannomyces. Um, has no problem with yeah. I think I'm bacteria also, as well. I'm also going to taste this for the next week, I think, because it's, <laughs> it's like it's so powerful on the palate. Like it's a really spectacular, spectacular a lot going beer. on. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, like one thing I do at the end of the beers, and we've we've had a lot of small glasses, but they add up. Um, I declare my favorite, and this has got to be 
Like this, this is off the charts. The, honestly, the, 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 four, the four squared was, was really, really lovely, refreshing. This is almost like the anti-beer of that. You know, like it's cool, clean, palate refreshing, you know, with some punch. This is like over the top, like just lovely, lovely, lovely sour. Like, I mean, Thanks. craziness, it's delicious. It's a lot of fun to make, but a lot of work. And I always ask random questions, like, it's not so random because I've been doing it, but which music, like, we, I kind of know because we heard some really awesome music coming in here. So tell, tell me about the, the music that is played to get folks pumped up and ready to brew quickly and powerfully. It wasn't always the case, but probably now we've got a lot of people who like to listen to, like, the heavier side of music or metal. Not to be ashamed about what that is. No, I'm, I'm definitely not, but it's like, it's not... I mean, for me personally, it's like when we're doing any of the barrel work, I'm convinced that the beer in the barrels wants metal. Oh, do you know what? The, the bass probably <laughs> jostles it in some kind of like subtle sonic way. Because like, like, if the like, bash doesn't turn out right, it's like because you weren't playing the right music. Yeah. <laughs> I'm convinced of that in the barrel. Well, I, I heard, I think I think we, we concluded Pantera on the way in, so it was uh, cool. We made, you guys, we made you guys turn it off though when you're in here because it's kind of like hard to, hard uh, yeah. to co converse like that. But. Well, as long as the beer gets it back, it'll be okay. Yeah. No, well, I mean, Thank you so much. Um, you probably pissed off the balling crew, though. Yeah. Making them turn I, the music Yeah, you're going to beat me up when I go there. <laughs> well, well, you'll be okay. They're going to look at us again. Um, you guys are, that was not cool. So I'd like to do a grand finale cheers with you guys to sort of cap off this amazing experience. I really, like I said at the beginning, really, really appreciate you guys inviting us in here, talking to you, sharing a bit about your backgrounds, talking about the beers, trying stuff like this is just, like, I heard, I, it's funny because this is already, like, legendary in the beer scene because people are saying, you got to find that. The new Mysterium Mysterio Vera, I'm like... There's a lot of buzz about this one. This is an awesome beer, so thank you, gentlemen. Salud. 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 Nazdrovia. Cheers. Schlant. Prost. Prost? Wait, we're almost... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm all out. All right, thank you, folks. The Beer Diaries done done. signing off. Thank you very much. <laughs>